you know, look, I, I think we could get to $50 billion in inflows this year, which is wow. outrageous. Now is we're right? about 12, 12, 13. And just to contextualize how crazy that is, before this ETF launched, the fastest growing ETF of all time in its first year was the Qs, NASDAQ 100 Qs, invested in NASDAQ technology stocks. And it brought in $5 billion in its first year. I'm saying wow. that these ETFs could do 10x that. And I don't think we'll stop there. I think, I think year two could be even bigger. Um, you know, look, if you zoom out, wealth managers globally control $100 trillion of wealth. What's 1% of $100 trillion? It's $1 trillion. <laughs> We've gotten $10 billion in. That's 1% 1, that's 1 of a $1 trillion. It's great. We should be excited. But there are miles to go. Last October, before the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission approved several spot Bitcoin exchange traded funds, Matt Hoogan, the chief executive officer of Bitwise, estimated that spot Bitcoin ETFs would bring in about $50 billion in inflows within the next five years. However, the actual success of the spot Bitcoin ETFs has far exceeded these predictions. In a recent interview with Crypto 101, Matt revises his initial forecasts, now suggesting that the ETFs could achieve this significant milestone in just 12 months. He also stresses the importance of the spot Bitcoin ETFs, maintaining that the huge milestones they've surpassed so far pale compared to what's coming in 2024 and beyond. A few weeks ago, Matt embarked on a journey to different cities to orange pill thousands of institutional investors to invest in Bitcoin through Bitwise's BITB Bitcoin ETF. Despite reduced demand, Matt says these investors showed a lot of interest in the spot Bitcoin ETFs, and most are talking about putting at least 3% of their portfolios into the products in the coming weeks and months. This unexpected response from institutional investors who have spent the past 15 years ignoring and demeaning the leading crypto asset is the exact reason why Matt is so bullish about Bitcoin, both in the short and long term. According to Matt, this is Bitcoin's IPO moment, and it's about to be a lot more successful than we all imagined. As we bring you clips from Matt's interview, please take a little time to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Also, we just launched a highly informative email newsletter to help savvy crypto investors like you stay up to date on important market trends and insightful analysis. It's linked in the description box below. Do ensure you check it out and sign up to stay updated. Thanks for the support and enjoy the video. It's been a phenomenal trip, an inspiring trip. 20 days on the road. It was a mix of speaking at conferences. As an example, I spoke at the Barron's Top RAA Conference, that's the 100 largest and most important registered investment advisors. I got on the main stage there and spent wow. an hour talking to them about Bitcoin. I was in Colorado. I was in Miami. I even made a trip to London. And basically, I wanted to do two things. One, I wanted to advance the case, of course, for Bitcoin and for Bitwise's ETF, BITB. But two, I wanted to see how financial professionals are thinking about Bitcoin, right? We're two months in are they adopting it in mass? Are they doing it all at once? Is it only retail investors and non-professional investors? And I'll give you three quick takeaways and then we can unpack them. Uh, the Love first it. is it's not just retail. I met financial advisors. I met with some of the most sophisticated family offices in the world, people who control 50, $100 billion. I met with institutional consultants. I met with, you know, wirehouse advisors and executives, firms like Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, et cetera. And they are adopting Bitcoin, not all at once, but they are adopting Bitcoin. They're some of the people who are purchasing our ETF. So it's not only retail. The second big takeaway, uh, and I tweeted this out, is that 3% is the new 1%. <laughs> so to unpack that, Bitwise has been serving this community of professional investors for almost seven years. And for those seven years, the message was get off zero, allocate something, maybe allocate 1% of your portfolio. We almost said it sort of sheepishly, like what could go wrong? You could lose 1% of your wealth if it goes to zero, at least do that. Now, people are saying 3% or 5%. I heard those two numbers much more than 1%. Again, not everyone's allocating. But if they are, they're talking about 3% or they're talking about 5%. And then the last thing that I really realized coming off of this trip is that the inflows we've seen into these ETFs over the first two months, which have been incredible, fastest growing ETFs of all time, 
those are going to continue, not in a straight line, but they're going to continue for multiple years. And the reason I say this is I just increasingly realized that there are all these secondary decisions that have to happen, right? We waited for 10 years for the SEC to approve an ETF and we celebrated. But now we need Morgan Stanley to approve ETF Mm. and UBS and Wells Fargo and Raymond James and all these other platforms that control trillions of dollars of wealth. And they're not all going to do it at once. That was the takeaway. Some are going to do it in May or June and some are going to do it in January of next year. And so I think we have many quarters of very strong inflows. I left the trip more bullish than I began, a little bit tired, maybe a little bit worse for wear, but um, it was an inspiring trip. Two things jump into my mind. One is the amount of initial inflows. I mean, I knew it was going to be successful, but this is so far off the charts, it's hard to believe. Bitwise's ETF, in my view, is the best Bitcoin ETF, but it's not the only Bitcoin ETF. It's not even the largest. And we're growing faster than the gold ETF grew when it launched. We're actually the wow. eighth fastest growing ETF of all time. So this is off the charts. Out of like 10,000 ETFs that have ever been launched. That's exactly right. Yes. That's crazy. Um, it's unbelievable. So the size of the flows uh, really has surprised me. And then the other thing is maybe more nuanced, which is, you know, like many of us, I spent six years fighting all sorts of familiar FUD. Yep criminal use FUD, energy use FUD, Tether FUD, um, Craig Wright FUD, (laughs) all of that have faded away. I actually got zero questions about those things. And people Mm -hmm. seem to have made this like overnight shift that Bitcoin's not going away. Mm -hmm. And if Bitcoin's not going away, those aren't the questions that matter. The questions that matter are now 1%, 3%, or 5%. A few weeks ago, Matt shared the details of a weekly memo he had sent to investment professionals. A part of the memo reads, The January launch of Spot Bitcoin ETFs opened up the crypto market to investment professionals in a major way for the first time ever. These investors control tens of trillions of dollars. Globally, the best estimate is over $100 trillion, and they are just starting to move into crypto. Think about the implications. We are all excited about the $12 billion that has flowed into ETFs since January, and it is exciting. But imagine global wealth managers allocate just 1% of their portfolios to Bitcoin on average. That would mean approximately $1 trillion of inflows into the space. Against this, $12 billion is barely a down payment. 1% down, 99% to go. During his interview with Crypto 101, the Bitwise CEO reveals that his previous 1% estimate may climb as high as 5%, because with the advent of giants like BlackRock and Fidelity into the Bitcoin space, investors are no longer just talking about getting off zero, but are looking to diversify larger shares of their portfolios to Bitcoin. Let's get back to the interview as Matt speaks further about Bitcoin's supply-demand dynamics, BlackRock and Jamie Dimon, and the possibility of the SEC approving a spot Ethereum ETF in May. That's exactly right, yeah. People say there's not enough Bitcoin, which I totally... Basically agree with. If you think about the Bitcoin market holistically, you have new Bitcoin being created by miners that has to be sold. And right now, as you mentioned, the ETFs are buying up 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x, 10x that. So the only thing that can happen is the price has to go up until long-term holders agree to sell. Now, it shouldn't be surprising to us that we've hit resistance at the all-time high. Think about from a behavioral perspective. If you've been a long-term investor, you're probably holding up for all-time highs and then you're willing to sell. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't surprise me similarly from a behavioral perspective if we hit a wall at 100 grand. If you're a long-term investor, you might have said, I'll sell some Bitcoin when it gets to $100,000. We're all humans. Like Those numbers do have a factor. Mm-hmm. Um, above that, I don't know where people sell. But yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, the price will rise until people are willing to sell. You back up two years ago, And if you were outside the crypto industry, you would have Jamie Dimon saying it's a pet rock (laughs) and you would have Sam Bankman Freed saying it's going to a million. And that's an unfair fight if you're a traditional finance person, rightfully so. Mm -hmm. Um, Today, you still have Jamie Dimon. But on the other side, the CEO of of JP Morgan, on the other side, you have Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, the largest crypto, the largest asset manager in the world. 
And he's saying this is an important part of the future. It could be the most valuable currency of all time. It's a store of value. Mm -hmm. And that provides a balance to someone who hasn't approached crypto. It would be easy to, to dismiss it if the only person you trust was anti-crypto. But now in the TradFi world, you have this equal representation of people who are skeptical of the asset and people who are strongly bullish on the asset. And that means people have to make up their own minds and some of them are breaking towards Bitcoin. It's pretty fun. This has been amazing. Yeah, I, 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 you know, we, we were at this for five plus years at Bitwise trying to launch a Bitcoin ETF. And right. uh, after the first day I tweeted, yeah, it's worth it. <laughs> and it has been worth it. It's, it's just been, uh, you know, when you, when, you're, when you believe in what this asset class can do for portfolios and for the world, to see people finally recognizing that and to see a clear path on the next few years of where this thing is going, uh, it's just tremendously fun. And, uh, and that keeps me going even when I'm on the road for 20 straight days. We always uh, want to get your thoughts on um, the, the Ethereum ETF or potentially even uh, any other altcoin ETFs. Absolutely. Um, you know, Bitwise has a filing uh, for an Ethereum ETF now, so I can't speak to the filing or our application, but I can speak to Ethereum ETFs in general. Okay. Uh, there's, there's my legal disclaimer. Perfect. Um, <laughs> uh, look, we've entered the ETF era of crypto. So it is truly a matter of when and not if on something particularly like Ethereum. I think the legal argument in support of an Ethereum ETF is very strong. There are already Ethereum futures ETFs and Ethereum futures are highly correlated with Ethereum itself. That's the same argument that won the Bitcoin battle and got us Bitcoin ETFs. Eventually, I think it's going to win the Ethereum battle and get us Ethereum ETFs. A big question in the market is, will it occur in May? May is the date the SEC has to respond to the first Bitcoin ETF application. I think Bloomberg puts the odds of that at 25% for approval. That strikes me as about right. It seems unlikely because you're not seeing the SEC and issuers go back and forth with filing updates. It's just not pattern matching to what you see prior to approval. But I wouldn't take a delay there as anything but that. A few days ago, Matt shared a string of tweets on X, in which he addressed claims that the Bitcoin halving is priced in, and that the much-anticipated event won't have any significant effect on prices. In his posts, Matt noted that the efficient mark hypothesis states that Bitcoin's current price reflects all known information about the crypto asset, including the halving. However, he disagreed with the conclusion that the halving, being already known to the market, won't move prices. He wrote, What the EMH folks leave out, however, is that the market doesn't know everything about the future. For instance, current prices only reflect the market's best guess of future demand for Bitcoin. What if the market is wrong? Specifically, what if future demand for Bitcoin is higher than the market? This is where the halving gets interesting in my opinion. The Bitwise CEO went on to describe two types of sellers in the Bitcoin market. Forced sellers, who are forced to sell to meet urgent needs, and willing sellers, who demand higher prices for their Bitcoin. He further notes that willing sellers are more impacted by changing market conditions and will frequently adjust the price at which they are willing to sell based on changing market conditions. He added that miners are the only real forced sellers in Bitcoin, as their activities involve significant direct costs that must be recouped. In his posts, Matt further noted that the halving will reduce the number of willing sellers, especially if demand remains high post-halving. Here are more posts from the thread. One thing people miss about the halving is that it changes the ratio of forced versus willing sellers for any given amount of demand. For instance, let's say there is a net demand for 1,000 Bitcoin per day. Currently, 90% of that comes from forced sellers, as miners produce 900 Bitcoin per day, post-halving, that will drop to 45%. That change is probably priced into the market. But if the market is wrong about future demand or future market conditions, the post-halving market will react differently than the pre-halving market because of the higher ratio of willing sellers to forced sellers needed to satisfy that demand. That's why I find the halving bullish, Matt noted in another post. I think the market has underestimated the long-term demand for Bitcoin, and I like the idea of that excess demand having to chase Bitcoin almost exclusively from people who don't need to sell.
Despite the reduction in demand for the ETFs in the past few weeks, Matt remains highly bullish, suggesting that they are only taking a brief breather until the second wave of demand, which he says will be even more bullish than the first. Do you agree with the predictions and outlook for the spot Bitcoin ETFs and the underlying crypto asset? Please drop your comments and observations in the comment section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.